I'm so thrilled to welcome you to this uh, first Q&A for Legend. And at this point, please join me in welcoming first the visionary writer-director of the film. He is already an Oscar winner for the screenplay for LA Confidential. He made the greatest movie of all time, A Knight's Tale. And now he follows that <laughs> with another wonderful movie, Legend. Please welcome Brian Helgeland. <laughs> Also joining us is the wonderful actress who has played lead roles in everything from Sucker Punch to The Uninvited. Still, I don't think even her biggest fans could have been prepared for her revelatory turn in this movie. Please welcome Emily Browning. Please welcome the transformative actor you've seen in films such as Warrior, Bronson, and Inception. With Legend, he delivers not one but two of the best performances of the year. Please welcome Tom Hardy. I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for being here. Congratulations on a wonderful movie and what I think many people are surprised is a very funny movie. Uh, I'm curious, Paul, when you first started to get into this story, I know you told us at the start Francis was in many ways your way in. Did you always know that you would have this tone of violence and, and humor? Yeah, well, just researching about them, there was a lot of black humor in the story. And uh, it's always, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a an acquired taste for some people, I guess. But it, it always seemed very funny, a lot of the things that went on as you winced. And, and, um, and I'm always drawn to that in a way. When bad things happen, I always compulsively start to make jokes just as a way of dealing with it. But I always thought it was going to be funny and, and, and other things as well and poignant. And, um, and I like to try to get all that stuff going at once. I think that if a scene is just one thing or just another thing, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. Well, I mean, it's so hard to be one of anything, to be funny, to be dramatic, to be poignant, and you have all of this in one movie. Uh, I have to imagine when the script found its way to you guys, I mean, was all, that all there on the page, and is that what drew you to the project? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it was all there on the page, and I think there's, a, there's something about uh, the nature of comedy, which if, it's not, not like circumstantial comedy, it's not like you're playing for laughs, but there's an awkwardness about the subject matter and, and what you're laughing at in a... For me, what came across was an element of um, kind of bouffant clown, which is to sort of revel in the grotesque and, and the darkness in a way that you laugh along and then you, what you see is what's underneath it, which is deeply disturbing. And, and does that make sense? So that's what came across to me. And, and so that's the kind of comedy that was there. Th does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Especially after having seen it, it makes perfect <laughs> sense. Yeah. Emily, what about you? How'd the script find its way to you? Um, I mean, it found its way to me just as most scripts do. It was just sent to me by my agent. But I think, I don't know if the, if the I mean, there was, a, there was a bit of humor in the script, I think. Um, but I, it was mostly when Tom kind of came out as Ron that, I mean, it was kind of ridiculous at times. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect it to be as funny. As, I mean, ridiculous in the sense that I was, I was cracking up and ruining takes because I really didn't expect him to be that funny. Um, and... I was very surprised when I watched the film for the first time. And I was surprised at myself for laughing at these really kind of horrible moments, but it's, it's very funny, so. I would really love to see the script because just things like when you kiss Ron and he makes that grunt, and it's so funny. <laughs> like, I don't know if that read in the script. Oh, no, that's or... not, that's, that's on the set, yeah. That's playing <laughs> it. 
Um, so the Krays obviously aren't household names in America, but growing up in London, or England, I should say, um, I don't know what neighborhood you grew up in. <laughs> okay, it was London. Um, I mean, were you familiar with them from a young age? Are they taught in school? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, they actually probably are, but um, <clears throat> I'm more in the playground, really. Um, yeah, uh, t to, be, to be fair, they're, they're well known in my country. Um, and we, we kind of have a, a history of sort of, um, in, in my opinion anyway, we sort of hark back to um, like villains and rogues and scallywags throughout history, whether it's even like medieval history, if it's kings or beheading their wives and stuff, you know. We, uh, we've got a taste for the grotesque or the slightly abhorrent or um, like the Jack the Rippers, you know, Sweeney Todd. You know, and they kind of fall under that iconography in a way, but they were made famous particularly by the, you know, David Bailey's portraits in the 60s and then became synonymous with a certain glamour. And everyone kind of wonders, like, well, what were they doing there? And then you peel, peel it back and you start to hear all these myths about them, but they're, they're fairly commonplace in, in the country, yeah. So did it help to have all this research at your disposal or was it hard because there's so many differing stories about the craze? And I believe, I mean, Ronald wrote his own book, didn't he? Ron wrote, Ron wrote his own. He, uh, that's the thing about a lot of these villains is they write hundreds of books. Do you know, um, an, another, a mate of mine, Charlie Bronson, has written about twelve. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> largely about press ups. You know, um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, the, the books, myths, legends, tales usually asinine circulate about you know people uh, like this, and um, so it's very hard to get a gauge on the truth on anything, um, and everybody's got a story and they pick it up and they run with it, so it's like a Chinese whisper effect. Um, so you can search a lot of research on the craze because everybody puts in a, you know, their two pence worth, as it were. So it's very hard to find something that's really bang on factually on them, apart from your primary sources in you know, photographs, BBC, Panorama, various documentary footage and whatnot, and then the people that will come out that will work and talk to you and stuff like that. But there's a plethora of, of like, like, kit, all about them, and most of it is nonsense. <laughs> so how do you know how to separate the nonsense from... You don't. Yeah. <laughs> you hit and hope, you know. I mean, Emily, in some ways, were you sort of freed from that because Francis wasn't as well known? Yeah, I guess so. I felt like there was slightly less pressure on me just because, you know, there wasn't such a strong idea in the collective consciousness in, in England of, of who she was. She's a slightly more mysterious character. Um, but I was just, you know, there are stories about her as well. Um, I met a couple, it was actually kind of after the fact, I met a few people who, who knew her. Um, but I was just, you know, it can be confusing sometimes when there are a lot of conflicting stories. So I was just happy to kind of go along with Brian's version of the story and follow his lead. And Brian, did you always intend on casting one actor as both Ron and Reggie? Yeah, well, I didn't know. Um, I didn't rule it out. <laughs> I didn't rule it out, but I knew... Um, <laughs> Did your pants do that? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Just a quick word from my sponsor. <laughs> Full of shit. <laughs> I met Tom and that happened, <laughs> and I knew it was, it was meant to be. But uh, I didn't have, I, I just knew I needed Reggie first. Really? And go from there, because Reggie's the lead of the two. And I thought, I, I don't know if, you know, at first just as an idea of casting, I don't know if the actor who plays Reggie wants to even play Ron, for example, and how it's going to go. But I met Tom, Tom got the script, and we had uh, an evening of truffle, French fries, I think it was. <laughs> and um, I just talked about Reggie, and he just talked about Ron. <laughs> and so we were just eyeing each other across the table, like, who's going to go for his, his gun first? And um, at the end, he said, I'll give you uh, Reggie if you give me Ron. And I said, that sounds like a good deal. And we just went from there. Wow. So was Ron the more appealing role to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, according to that story, yeah, <laughs> as, as we just heard. Like, um, but yeah, totally. I, I felt there's a, th if I was to be offered one out of both of them and I could only have one, then I would, I would definitely go for Ron. That was my first. Do you know what I mean? But in hindsight, I, I, I love them both. Yeah. I mean, as characters, because I'm very greedy and 
<laughs> and I really enjoyed doing the film. I mean, I love that there are such subtle differences between them that I really do feel like I'm watching two different actors. Um, how did you go about achieving, I mean, frankly, Ron looks taller in some scenes, and I don't know how you pulled that off. Yeah, Ron is taller. He's a, about an inch and a half taller. That's a very, it's a, it's a very high-tech thing we put in Tom's shoe. That. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lifts. <laughs> yeah. And there also, uh, is there some prosthetic work on Ron? No, no actually, there's no um, prosthetic work on him. There's, um, the teeth are yours? Yeah, n n no, but they weren't prosthetics. Oh. I, don't, I don't think they're called, they, they can't, they're teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Fancy that, <laughs> but, but like, yeah. But you, you, and they had like special gums made out of uh, sort of like some kind of plastic, which pushed out the jaw. Because if you look at Ronnie, as he got older, he started to, to bloat a bit or, or retain water or whatever it was to do with, or well, the barbiturates, whatever drugs he was on to, um, to you know, to stem his um, his his mental illness, as it were. Uh, he seemed to inflate a bit, and uh, and, uh, and it, it, that was. That was useful because when they were younger, they looked very similar. So it would have been, you know, we, we went for the silhouette on Ronnie to be slightly, slightly larger, a bit rounder. Um, he also had a widow's peak in his hairline, which I don't have naturally because I'm receding. So, well, <laughs> which is which is actually quite cool. Anyway, I said, um, <laughs> just put that out there, <laughs> and um, and I'm good with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> mega confident about that, and I don't give a fuck. So, moving forward, we we then put a wig on. But actually, and then and then we stuck um, something up my nose, so it looked like it was broken, and 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 then some stipple underneath my eyelids to make me look a little bit older. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? No, it's just and some and some lifts in my shoes. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine acting with something up your nose. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound easy. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's trivia. It's trivial. <laughs> Were you prepared for the logistical challenges, though, of having one actor in two scenes? I mean, another thing is, Ron looks heavier, and there were times when I was wondering if you shot this entire movie twice. No, I, I'm, there's some work done with the costume and stuff, but, but Tom also has a, he can add 10 pounds in, in front of you. He can just kind of- Do it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a secret. But yeah, he actually can. He, just the way he holds himself and his posture and everything. And so between the two things, we pulled it off. Magic. <laughs> but I mean, was it... How yeah, did you no, it was... Um, there's a bag of tricks that, that haven't changed much since Haley Mills, really. And... Um, the exact reference yeah. for this performance, <laughs> I was, yeah. But there is. I mean, there's things we learned how to do. We did camera tests and we did all that stuff. But the, the trick was... Um, the way I describe it is if, if it had been two different actors, I have two actors who won't go on, on set with each other. And one says, you know, when you're shooting Ron, I'm out of here. And the other, when, the other one says, when you're shooting Reggie, I'm out of here. And, I have to, and, and they have to figure out how to, how to get some dynamic going between themselves and not be there. And I think that's the, that's the trick of it. The technical part of it is the technical part of it. Although we, we'd learned things we could push as we went along, and when we could, he could touch himself, and those kind of things. That sounds awkward, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. What was it like, like op acting opposite yourself? I, I get on with myself incredibly well. <laughs> so obviously I could predict some of the things I was gonna do, but sometimes I really threw myself. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, you know. That's what happens. But like, that's in the moment, isn't it? But like, um, it, that, actually, that, it was pretty technical in that aspect. Of we kind of had to guess what was going to happen at the beginning. Well, hang on, how do we get this back to front or front to back? You had to know going in at the top of the day what was going to happen at the end of the day, which completely sucks the life out of any scene. Um, but then work out a way to breathe life into it by being painstakingly um, methodical about what we were going to accomplish within an eight hour period and then let the bitch breathe <laughs> <laughs> and find out a way of breathing life into it, which was the most complicated thing was keeping the ensemble together so that everybody knew, you know, you didn't drain um, the opportunity to have a, a, a seamless performance, which is, it was quite, but it was like a, it was a bit of an equation. What was it like working? <laughs> for you. Yeah, because you've already had, you had the hardest job, to be fair, out of all of it. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> I think, well. no, it was, I, it was, um, 
you know, technically getting used to shooting everything twice was a little bit strange at first, but I think it's kind of a testament to Tom's performances that just genuinely felt like I was working with two different actors, you know. It's just not... I don't think I had a very hard yeah. job, to be honest with you. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> working with me is hard enough anyway, you know? That's true. That's a good point. I, I, actually, yeah. <laughs> I think the best way to describe it is if, when we shot overs, and we had a, a Tom's body double, who was a stuntman, also Jacob Tamuri, who's fantastic. But we'd shoot Reggie first, and we'd do overs on, you know, over Ron onto Reggie. And Tom had to figure out what his physical reaction as Ron was going to be and teach it to Jacob before he did it so that we, we were on overs on Jacob that it would match so I could cut back and forth whether the hand was here or he was looking, looking away when Reggie said this line, or whatever it was. And, and Tom would teach it to Jacob before he did it, and then Tom would come in and do it after Jacob had established it, at least from the, from the over. Because that fight scene is flawless. And, and believe me, I was looking. <laughs> I'm curious, how long did that take to shoot? Two days. That's but, but, but a day for each brother. And, um, and it, was, it was a bit painful, to be fair. <laughs> because we, we slapped each other senseless. <laughs> because we figured that we'd have to get it out of the way quite quickly and it had to be, you're gonna, you, it's a vulnerable, sp uh, because of the camera's on you, we didn't have a huge amount of money to hide the face and, and it's moving, it's even harder. So a lot of the slapping came out of, well, not only do brothers not necessarily want to kill each other when they're fighting and, it's, and, and there's another reason for two technically hard men who are well known for their boxing and fighting ability would look it would be a smarter and more elegant way of showing a fight scene if they weren't so cool mm. when they were fighting. Um, and it was, it was a bit of a bitch fight, you know, <laughs> and a little bit embarrassing, actually, and humiliating and just awkward, um, but still gets more brutal as it goes along. The hands helped us to hide the faces a lot, so, um, so we slapped each other senseless for, you know, for two days with rings on, which was a really bad idea because we had rings. That was it. Oh. And, um, yeah, yeah no, I, that morning Tom came up to me and he said, how many takes are we going to do? And it was day 30 and he had never asked me that. And I said, <laughs> why do you want to know? And he said, because I, I think Jacob and I are going to really hit each other. And uh, I said, three takes, which helped me a lot in the editing room. And I said, three takes. And he, he was kind of like, okay, I can pace myself. But then we, it was three takes for Reggie and then three takes for Ron. Oh. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so much of acting is reacting. Uh, so I, I, can I ask a little bit more about Jacob? I mean, was he actually acting opposite yeah, you? Yeah, Jacob's like pretty much the unsung hero at this point. And in, in much the way that he was more Mad Max than I was, again, he did all of this and I got the credit for it. Um, <laughs> again. <laughs> but um, this is arguably, for me, technically the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. Um, I thought when we, when we were breaking it down at the beginning that there was a path whereby we could have had uh, an actor for the sort of the reacting and, and the, the dialogue who I could banter with and then a physical body double who would be Jacob. Um, when that third party fell out, then Jacob inherited the entire gig and he doesn't call himself an actor, though he, is a, he does act. It was a particularly hard job to do. And he had about six hours worth of um, rehearsal with me in my kitchen. And I ran all the scenes on my iPhone with my glasses on and my glasses off. And we went scene by scene and he sat there looking at me like, fucking hell, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got me into? And I'm like, listen, we'd be fine. we would be fine. <laughs> and we recorded everything. He had a little iPhone with all the scenes on. Do you remember? And he'd come in in the morning and look at them and go, okay. And, and it didn't change that much. Then we'd record the sound and he'd know that. And then he was pushed out. Like, go, go at it, mate. Off you go. And uh, he was excellent. Uh, he was there for every single step of the way and even had lived the line. I really hurt him, actually. I bent him up like a pretzel. I, <laughs> I actually hurt him really badly, which came out of Jacob. Out of nowhere, he was enjoying himself <laughs> so much that it was, that was his little piece. And it was awesome, so we kept it. Thanks, you might have Jacob. created an actor. A beast, actually. He's, he's actually doing Everest now. He's doing a, a, an Everest story right now. Are you serious? Like, as an actor? Yeah, deadly serious. Yeah, he's really good. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, he's here? <laughs> no, he's probably down there looking at some point. 
Um, was there anything that you guys learned in your research? I mean, there's obviously the movie is called Legend, so there's obviously so many stories about the craze that you wanted to include in the movie, but you just couldn't for time or, you know, took away from the story. Well, I mean, you, it's kind of you can you can find what you're looking for if you're looking for something because there's so many variations. But um, I was mostly just surprised at how much information and how little it told you about the whole thing. Um, for me, the big thing was I spent a day with this guy who was in the firm, Chris Lambriano, and there was a bunch of things about my research and my outline that I had at the time that didn't make sense, and I asked him about Francis, because I had asked many people about Francis, and no one seemed to know anything about her or couldn't recall her very well. And he immediately, without skipping a beat, he said, Francis is the reason we all went to prison. And when he said that, I knew it was imp I didn't know what he meant, but I knew it was important. And he went on to describe how Reggie always sorted everything. So if someone in the neighborhood was seen talking to the police, Reggie would be by a couple of days later knocking on the door and, and asking <laughs> what, what they were talking about and what was going on. And if there was an investigation, he'd bribe a cop or bribe a juror. And he said after Francis died, he immediately stopped doing all that. And uh, they could feel the police coming closer and closer. And that was... That told me a lot about how it filled in a lot of things that didn't make sense about Reggie, especially the second, the later part of the, the end. And um, that was the most helpful thing I found. Was that sort of when you found your way into the script? Because you were saying Francis was really the turning point yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. I knew how to write it when I heard that story. And. Um, there is obviously, I, I keep talking about how funny this movie is, but obviously there's a lot of seriousness as well. Um, was it difficult for you guys emotionally? I mean, are you the kind of actors that can leave your work behind at the end of the day, or did you take these characters home with you somewhat? God, I hope you didn't take Ron home with you. <laughs> are you waiting for me to answer? Well, no, I <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't take my work home with me. I think I'd lose my mind. I, it was pretty easy to kind of separate myself from the character, I think. I'm exactly the same, to be fair. Like, I, I be, it would be wrong to switch off from doing the job because I know what I've got to do tomorrow morning and there's not a lot of time between end of day to the next morning. So, but, you know, I'd sleep for that amount of time and then go back into work in the morning. So <laughs> that was it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it, and this, this is a job that I really enjoyed. So it was something you could leave. You put a costume on, you do your thing, you take your costume off, you know, and then you go home, and then you come back and do it again. It wasn't very intense in that aspect because there's so much technically to do. We need to have a, a constant conversation with Brian and the team and Emily and everybody there about what we're going to do today. So it wouldn't help to walk around with Moroni on and Moregi on, <laughs> giving Mr. Meth, you know what I mean? Oh, don't really buy into that anyway, you know. Um, all these years later, people are still so fascinated by the craze. What do you think is the secret to that like enduring fascination? Yeah, I know it's it's one of the. I think part of it is the, is the time and place. They're from London in the in the 60s, which is a. Uh, people have a lot of feelings about that still, and they they're part of that fabric of that. So I think it's part of that, the nostalgia of that, the nostalgia of a kind of glorious time that they were the kind of the, the dark part of that that thing. But it, it's tough to say. Outlaws are always. Some, some go, but some stay, you know, Robin Hood and uh, Jesse James and Dylan Jurtz, they don't go away, and I don't, I don't really know why. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious if, uh, you know, actually filming in these locations, uh, has anyone who knew the craze seen the movie? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. We had um, a lot of the, 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 out, like the, the people who are still alive within the firm were at the premiere, um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> what was their reaction? Yeah, it's all right, mate. Yeah, you've done well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't how I remembered it, but, you know, you done well. You got them down, you know. <laughs> can you take a photograph of me? Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you sign this? I've got this movie about myself. Are you, can I send it to you? <laughs> Which is good, you know, I suppose, isn't that? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, I think the Fred Foreman one is up next, isn't it? And can I just ask, um, what are you guys up to next? What are you working on? Where can we see you next? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm working with my dad at the moment. Um, with your dad? Yeah, which is awesome. I'm um, writing and um, well, he's writing. I'm not doing anything actually. Um, <laughs> doing fuck, fuck all. <laughs> but, um, I'm producing something with um, um, Scott Free and the BBC and FX for um, for, for telly. In uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Are you going to be in it? Or? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Cool. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about it? Uh, it's called Taboo, and it's about a bloke who comes. Oh, it's about a bloke. It's about <laughs> <laughs> it's about a geezer. But um, <laughs> it, uh, um, it's, it's set in the eight, eighteen twelve, and it's about a man who comes back from the Congo, having been involved with sort of slave trading and whatnot out there, who gets who inherits the shipping company and goes up against the East India Company. And your dad's writing it? Yeah, with well, Steve Knight is, is um, show running it, and my father's writing. It's something that my father had come up with, so we can have a little punt at you know, pouring back into some British television together and see what, what, what happens. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I get to work with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm trying to be very patient and wait for something as good as this was to come up next, so... That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Brian? <laughs> I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be traveling around with this movie, which is a job in and of itself. I know that you premiered at the Toronto Film Festival last week, and um, I know the response was rapturous. Um, I know because I was there. <laughs> um, what was it like to see with an audience, you know, 2,000 people, you know, Canadians who have probably never heard of the craze? responding to the movie like this. You know, honestly, I just sit there and think that there's something wrong with the left surround, so. <laughs> that's, that's what I do, I sit there and I'm like, the, the some, sound was some, something in the left surround and the center, the center channel's off and <laughs> that's about it. And for you guys? Well, then everybody left. We were told to sit, sit in the seat because the light will come up and you're like, okay, but everybody's gone. <laughs> and then when, the, when it was empty, the screening room, the, the lights came up and we just sort of sat there alone. Like, well, that was... And there were like two people down there <laughs> waving. Yeah, yeah I, wonder, I wonder what that means. <laughs> but it was awesome to see on such a big a big screen. Yeah. And it was a massive auditorium, wasn't it? Yeah, it's interesting to see as well with the... Because we had a premiere in London also and it was interesting to see the difference between the North American audience and the English audience really? in terms of what they found funny. You know, because I think... And this room, actually, this was... Yeah. Massive laugh, like more laugh than I've heard. You in guys it. were watching yeah, tonight. Got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. Thank God you all. Always behave. sneak in. <laughs> yeah. I'm always in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was sitting through tonight too, and you guys had a great response. So yeah, thank you. Yes. Thanks. So congratulations again on a wonderful movie. Thank you guys thank so much you. for being here. Thank you.